Good afternoon. I'm Rebecca Blank, the Joan and Sanford Wild Dean of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. I want to welcome you to our City Group Lecture Series, which was established by a gift in honor of President Gerald Ford from the City Group Foundation to bring distinguished leaders thought leaders and lecturers here to campus. I am really pleased today to have Dr. Kamal Davis with us, and he is going to be um, speaking in a few minutes, but I just want to welcome him for being here. He will be formally introduced in just a minute. At the Ford School, we are committed to fostering interaction among those within the community who have a real interest in discussion of public affairs. The City Group Lecture provides an important opportunity to ask questions and to explore ideas with distinguished individuals who've worked at the highest levels of national and international policy. We welcome everyone who's joined us today for this lecture and for the discussions that are going to ensue after it. We are particularly grateful to City Group for making this type of opportunity available. With us today on behalf of City Group is Jamie Mystery of Smith Barney, which is the local representation for City Group here in town. And I'm going to ask Jamie to say a few words. Thank you for coming, Jamie. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome. What a great honor on behalf of City Group to be joining you this afternoon. And a great honor, of course, to be welcoming our distinguished guest, Kamal Dervis, to Ann Arbor and to the university. Uh, this, this event marks the first of the City Group lectures to be held in the new home of the Ford School of Public Policy. Uh, most of you are probably already aware of the very generous personal gift from City Group's now former chairman, Sandy Weil, and his wife, Joan, to the Ford School. Uh, so there is a special sort of a significance to today's event uh, as we now begin the, to present the City Group Lecture Series here in Weill Hall. And what a beautiful facility you have here. Uh, the City Group Foundation, in endowing this remarkable lecture series, continues a long tradition of supporting education, uh, interaction, and open dialogue around the globe. This type of lecture series is one of many events that makes life on the Michigan campus so enriching and unique. And thank you for your participation today. Uh, we hope you'll be able to join us for future lectures in the series. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jamie. I'd now like to introduce the director of the International Policy Center, Pro Professor Jan Svenar, who will in turn introduce today's speaker, Dr. Kamal Dervis. He, Dr. Dervis, as you know, is the director of the United Nations Development Program. The International Policy Center was established here in the Ford School in 2005 to bring together students, faculty, and researchers from across campus with events, speakers, and research activities focused on a range of issues relating to international economics, institutions, political economy, and global health. And Jan has just been an excellent initial director and leader to this whole effort. So Jan, I'll turn things over to you. Well, it's a real pleasure to uh, introduce Kemal Dervish to you. Kemal and I go back a long, long way. Uh, well, I should first say he is a remarkable person in many respects. He's a product of the French Lycée, London School of Economics as an undergraduate, PhD from Princeton, and that's where I had the opportunity to meet him. He was actually subsequently on the faculty as a professor at Princeton when I was a graduate student there. And I've always thought whatever I uh, don't know, it's because I didn't pay enough attention in Kemal's classes. He was, he was a great, great teacher. Well, Kemal went on from Princeton, uh, had a very stellar rising career in the World Bank. I had an opportunity to work with him. He was kind enough to bring me in on some of the fun stuff that was being done at the World Bank at that time. He became vice president, uh, was in charge of Europe, Middle East, North Africa, as well as other activities in the bank, and uh, then uh, went back to save his own country. He was what the economists call the economic supremo uh, of Turkey. He uh, held position as the minister of the economy as well as treasury and uh, led Turkey out of one of the major crises, uh, a real modern day sort of economic feat of uh, applied economic policy. Uh, he then was member of the Turkish uh, parliament representing Istanbul and actually was one of the key negotiators of the European constitution, the one that uh, failed to be approved on the first round, but many people are working on it, uh, hopefully getting it approved on the second round. And Kemal was there representing Turkey, uh, a potential incoming member in the future into the European Union. Um, subsequent to that, he was drafted to serve now as the administrator of the United Nations Development Program. Sounds modest, but the administrator is like the president. It's uh, the equivalent of the president of the World Bank, so you have the head of the UNDP, and that's Kemal. 
and uh, he is in that capacity actually overseeing all the uh, activities that the UN has in terms of uh, economic development. And it's a pleasure to have him here today to speak about the challenges of multilateralism. I should add that we had two choices here. One was to have a formal on the record discussion, in which case he would have to hold himself back. I said, let's go off the record. Uh, that way he can be loose and talk to us uh, as if he had no constraints. And uh, then if you would like to quote him on the record or something like that, you'll have a chance afterwards to talk to him and get your quote. So uh, this is the rules. It's the Chatham House rules. You can ask any questions. He'll answer them as well as he can, given his uh, personal constraints. And it's a real pleasure to have you here, Kamal. Well, it is my great pleasure and privilege to be here, really, with, with all of you. Uh, Dean Blank, thank you very much for inviting me. Jan, uh, uh, Jamie, it's great. And I have other friends in the audience that I can see. It is uh, always very good to be in an academic setting. I did start very early my career as an academic, both in Turkey and then teaching at, at Princeton. And then Jan gave a summary. Uh, but it's, it feels very good to be in, in an academic setting. I think you're lucky to be in this beautiful building with all the, uh, the minds here, the discussions. It's a, it's a very special time of life, and I think one, one has to enjoy it fully. I will talk, you know, I've learned as in politics that there's no such thing as off the record, but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I, will <laughs> I will, of course, uh, try to be as, as free as possible. Uh, but, you know, when something then gets published, we'll, we'll go over it uh, in, uh, for some of the details. Choosing a topic is very difficult, of course, for always. And one can't fit into 40 minutes uh, everything one wants to say and one wants to share with such a wonderful audience. I want to talk about multilateralism really today and, and really make a, a plea for multilateralism, both in the political and in the economic area, and try to share with you some of the arguments that I've accumulated throughout my life, whether it's in academia, at the World Bank, in my own country, uh, at the European Convention, and, and now at, at the United Nations. So uh, it will be points rather than a fully integrated presentation, but I think that's all we really have time for, and I do want to put it, try to put it all together. The first point I'd like to make is that globalization, you know, much used and often abused term, is really an important part of, of modern times, that we are increasingly living in a world which is more connected, more interdependent than anything we've seen in the past. There was always uh, interdependence, uh, even, even 2,000 years ago. Diseases did spread across borders. Uh, the, the world was always linked to some degree, but the degree of linkage we have today is, is by nature, or, or it's not just quantitative, there's a qualitative change, both in the economic and the, in the political sphere. Uh, take the economy, for example. It is true that at the end of the 19th century, the share of trade in global GDP was already quite high, and it caught up. Then there was a period after the First World War, the Great Depression, the Second World War, where it fell. It caught up in, in the early 70s with the level it was at the end of the 19th century. Now it is 50% higher than that, but it's not just the volume of trade, it's the degree to which global production systems are integrated, the degree to which any product we, we buy today has components coming from all over the world. Uh, so it's not just the volume, it's the way uh, multinationals and, uh, organize their production, plan their production, it's the way small firms fit into that whole system. That's one, one angle, if you like, on the economic side. The financial system. Uh, of course, there was direct foreign investment in the past. In fact, the, as, opposed, as compared to British GDP, foreign direct investment from the UK at the time of the British Empire was even larger than it is today. But what's happening today is that the gross flows are much, much larger than net flows. It's not just money moving from one place to another. It's money moving sometimes within 24 hours, thanks to Citibank and others, three or four times in and out of, of one place. So uh, financial integration is much, much more advanced. And in, indeed, with the modern technologies, derivatives, and so on, we're, we're, we're even having a hard time keeping up with the degree of financial in integration there is. In the on the political side, uh, 
of course, the you know it, these are the biggest of all topics. Uh, the danger in terms of security, human survival that we faced ever since the nuclear age is much larger than, than anything that we ever faced before and is continuing. So uh, uh, from a security point of view, whether it's the nuclear threat, which we are again rediscovering these days, we somehow had forgotten about it. But now, you know, with nuclear pr uh, proliferation, the North Korean problem and all that, we say, wait a minute, we, we actually still have nuclear issues to face. And I think they're going to become bigger uh, as the uh, oil and gas price will probably remain quite high. It may go down, up and down, but fundamentally I think that all forces tend to say that the hydrocarbon you know, will, will be very scarce, so the price will be very high. I think nuclear energy technology is again going to be a priority for many countries. And of course, once a country develops nuclear energy uh, technology, then the, the step from there to nuclear weapons is not that big a step given the advances in, in, in know-how and in technology. So I think the interdependence on the, of the world on the security side is as great as ever and, and, and greater. And of course, you know, terrorism, the, the whole, uh, the whole uh, threat perceived, uh, you know, it may not be of, of a massive destruction, but it is true that when we board a plane today, you know, we, the threat is palpable, it's present. So I think there's a tremendous degree of interdependence of human security also on, on that side. Climate change, I'm not a specialist of the issue. I want to find the time to read more carefully about it. But many of my friends who really do know more about it have really convinced me that this is a serious issue. It's not just a scare. It may take a long time, but we do have a major, major environmental challenge here. And again, it stress, I think one, one has to stress the interdependence. One example, I think, which is telling is the role the Brazilian rainforest plays on, on this issue of climate change and environment. I don't know the, whether the exact numbers are, are, are right or wrong, but it doesn't matter, give or t take 20%. Uh, experts, some experts say that the Brazilian rainforest has a carbon retention capacity worth about $5 trillion. So that's what it's worth as a stock in terms of carbon retention. Now, therefore, if Brazil diminished that by 1%, that's $50 billion worth, right? So in a sense, it's the Brazilian forest. Nobody should dispute the fact that the forest is owned by Brazil. On the other hand, it's also a human asset, a humanities asset, an asset of the international community. So one could argue that, well, if it's, if it's a public good that everybody benefits from, why not help the Brazilians preserve it? Why not, uh, you know, make available from the international community $50 billion to Brazil to finance the preservation, you know, of, of, the, of the rainforest? Well, when you, when you compare that to the total number of foreign aid available in the world of about 100 billion, obviously you see that that's not going to happen tomorrow. But I think it's a very vivid example of how national and international issues interact, global public goods or global public bads. I did read two weeks ago, the United States actually did conclude a debt for environment swap with Guatemala at a very small you know, scale. So the whole idea of swapping resources against environmental assets is not outlandish. In fact, it's happening. But at the scale of the Brazilian rainforest, of course, it would be very difficult. So all these are examples, I think, of, of interdependence, of why many issues in the world have to be handled with a global public policy perspective by the international community acting and behaving as a community rather than just individual uh, nation states. Comparing all these issues to the role in a nation state plays in the traditional sense, the, you know, the traditional Westphalian nation state, I think one can distinguish three dimensions always. There's the regulatory dimension. There is need for some kind of regulation at the global level. There is the public goods provision dimension, and the two things are often related because you can provide public goods by regulation rather than necessarily by by you know, providing the service yourself. The private sector can be active, but if you regulate it the right way, then you can, uh, you can fulfill your public goods requirements. And then finally, there's the redistribution aspect of, of a nation state nationally. 
uh, most nation states, all nation states, find that the market mechanism does not produce the income distribution or the social welfare distribution that is considered politically acceptable by society. So the state does engage more or less, but always engages in some redistributive activity. And I think in, in, on all these three dimensions, we increasingly need something at the regional and global level. And this is becoming stronger and stronger and stronger, and I think will 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 in fact increase uh, dramatically in the next 10 to 20 years, particularly because of issues such as climate change, but also security issues, which I think are very, very uh, critical. And, you know, in a sense, we, we, I remember in growing up, the nuclear danger was very, you know, we felt it. We came very close to massive human destruction during the Cuban Missile Crisis. I, f I remember those days particularly not because I was that old, don't get me wrong, you know, in 1960, but as a kid, I was living in Turkey, and we found out, we didn't even know about it, that the equivalent of the Soviet missiles that were installed in Cuba, the U.S. had installed in Turkey, pointing at the Soviet Union. And so the deal was, it was, you know, it was a deal between Khrushchev and, and President Kennedy, although it wasn't advertised at the time, that the U.S. would quietly dismantle the, 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 um, the missiles in Turkey in exchange for the Soviets dismantling the missiles in, in Cuba. And, you know, some of you must have read the, the, the book on the Cuba missile crisis, how close we came to, you know, utter destruction world, worldwide at that time. So I think after the Cold War, the, the, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the disappearance of the Berlin Wall, we came a little bit complacent that somehow that danger had passed. And I think now we're discovering that the destructive capacity is still there, and if that whole issue isn't managed multilaterally uh, or managed in some form, I'm, I'm arguing that it has to be uh, so multilaterally, we're again facing the same kinds of dangers. Now, when we look at the institutions, the, the kind of world architecture of multilateralism, we discover a bewildering variety, a very complex system. Institutions w were created and grew over time somewhat haphazardly. Of course, there was a grand design at the end of Second World War with the creation of the United Nations, the San Francisco Declaration and all that. But then many things were added, both in the political and the economic field. And we now have, you know, almost hundreds of institutions. Within the United Nations itself, we have 38 United Nations organizations, and then you have to, to add others. And I think if you, if you ask a kind of citizen of the world somewhere in any country to explain that or even to tell you a little bit what they know about it, it's very little. It's, it's, it's very little. It's not easy to understand. It's not easy to explain. It reminds me a little bit of a computer program. Now, of course, you guys all have the students have all these packages. But when Jan and I were students, uh, you know, I actually programmed my own PhD thesis uh, in Fortran, the, the, the solution algorithm to a general equilibrium model. And, uh, you know, I know that with those programs, after a year of adding this and adding that, they become so complicated, you have to throw them away and start from scratch, basically. And it, it, the international architecture is a little bit like that. It's so complex that uh, because it's been added and added ad hoc that it has reached i think this point i don't think we can do the same as we do with a with a computer program but really a kind of a, new, a look a holistic look at what we're trying to achieve with all this architecture i think is needed because otherwise also in terms of just explaining it and getting backing for it it's very very difficult so um when we w when we look at it what we find is there is the overarching kind of United Nations framework, and even the World Bank and the IMF are part of that framework. And then there are the very many specialized organizations, and each sector, each, um, each global issue, in a way, has created an organization. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. In, in, in a very empiric, um, empiricist approach to life, you could even say that's the best way to do You have an issue, don't try to create some grand design. Uh, just, you know, focus on that particular issue, see how, who can deal with that issue, get the people together and try to deal with it. And that's an approach to global public goods, which I think, you know, is, is quite reasonable in many ways and works to some degree. 
and, and you know you don't need an overall grand design to solve everything. So that's what we have. We we have the World Health Organization that deals with health problems. We have the uh, uh, International Labor Office that tries to elaborate on labor standards and labor policies. You have, of course, some things which we don't uh, even think about, like the International Postal Union. When you think about it, letters, I mean, now, of course, emails don't have basically abolished letters, but, you know, letters for decades, we used to write letters and they came and, you know, they had stamps and everybody knew how much they had to pay and so on. But this is an example of an international organization that actually provided a service for, for the whole international community, not a very controversial service in this case, but that works. So I certainly don't want to argue against uh, a kind of pragmatic issues oriented approach, but I do want to argue that we do need something more than that on the big issues, on the, on the much more controversial issues. And here what we have is blocked, is kind of doesn't, you know, doesn't, doesn't advance. Within the United Nations we have the Security Council, which is a product of the Second World War, the way it was created. The victors, you know, uh, gave themselves the permanent veto and permanent membership. And then their elected members, the size was increased at some point, but essentially it reflects what, what was the case after the Second World War. And when you think of the Security Council, um, it has a certain, it, it has its legitimacy. It is part of the United Nations machinery, I think, the recent years have shown that despite its failings and despite, despite the fact that it rep represents the world of 50 years ago, it still has a certain amount of legitimacy, but it is very contested and easily blocked. One permanent member's veto can stop any action. And we see it today in parts of conflicts like in Sudan and elsewhere, you know, that there is always this question of can the UN act? For, for, for um, people like myself who actually work as a UN staff member on the staff side of the UN, there's this big confusion, of course, in public opinion between UN as an organization and the UN as a family of nations. And it, it is always very um, disturbing to us and not, 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 very, you know, not a nice event when somebody says the UN is inactive, can't do anything, isn't moving. You know. Well, we can't move unless it's on these issues unless the Security Council actually makes a decision. And you know, without that decision, we, we are totally blocked. So there's that side of the UN, and then there's the General Assembly. And the General Assembly, it, it, it is a fantastic uh, institution. It, the whole world is there, all the countries are there. Um, I think it has a tremendous degree of legitimacy because of the universality, because of the fact that everything, everybody's there. But it does have the feature, if you like, that a very, very tiny country vote is, counts the same as the vote of China and India or, or, or the US and, and, uh, or France uh, or Brazil. And of course, there's a debate, is, is that functional? I mean, is that really workable? Is that a reasonable way of, of making decisions? Now, the General Assembly does have power of the purse in the UN. It does have some influence on how the organization is run. It elects ECOSOC, which then elects boards of the funds and programs and so on. But in terms of real decision-making power, it is very limited, of course. So you have this duality within the United Nations of a Security Council which has decision-making power, but a council that can be easily blocked by a single permanent member. And then you have the large General Assembly where nobody can block any, 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 any decision per se alone, but where you kind of have a culture of consensus which reflects the fact that an actual vote of the General Assembly is, is something that many would perceive as a strange thing. So the best thing is to have consensus because if you have consensus, you don't face the vote thing. You have the same problem at the WTO in the World Trade Organization. You know, here, I, th I think there are now 150 members there, strictly speaking, all members are equal, and you have to move by consensus, which makes it sometimes extremely hard to move, as we saw in the recent uh, Doha talks. When you go to the economic sphere of the international system, the financial sphere, you have the IMF and the World Bank with a very different governance structure, which is based on weighted voting, where actually there are constituencies, groups of countries that 
form group blo blocks or constituencies, and, and the vote at the board reflects uh, certain measurements such as the international, the, the weight in the international econo economy of these countries. You can debate the weights, so there's, a, there's a lot of debate on the weights, but the system does function in a somewhat more flexible way, although of course there is a de facto veto also, because for some decisions you need 85% of the vote, and for example the US that has 17% of the vote can block certain decisions. But it is true that in the Bretton Woods system, because of the weighted voting, you, you do get you know, you uh, somewhat more flexibility in, in the whole governance mechanism. However, the Bretton Woods system is very much dominated, of course, by the richest countries. It is very much f perceived as being a, a G7 dominated uh, system, the G7 being the major uh, industrial rich countries, which have now become the G8 with, with Russia. And in that sense, uh, it, it really does lack the legitimacy in, in, the, in the kind of political, psychological sense, particularly in developing countries, that the UN does have. Despite all the, you know, the, the limitations of the UN, there is this legitimacy, which is we can debate exactly where it comes from, but it really does exist. And the same degree of legitimacy uh, is, is not really uh, an asset for the Bretton Woods institution. They are considered in a much more antagonistic way by public opinions in, in most developing countries. We also have regional organizations, of course. I don't want to go too much into that, just to say that we have to think not only globally, but also in terms of regionally. My, my basic feeling is that the regional and global should, should interact and reinforce each other. I don't think it's a either or, you know, build regional institutions or global. I think we need both, and we need both in a way that, that they help each other. So in this, in this overall um, picture, what has been proposed for change? What, what, what are the avenues of change that are being explored, debated? Well, one, as you know, was the Secretary General's proposals last year for reform of the actual Secretariat part of the United Nations, including the Security Council. I must say that when I came to the UN a year ago, and I was all you know, excited about the Security Council, I had written a book for Brookings before I joined the UN, thank God, because what I wrote there, therefore, was not you know, due to the fact that I had joined. Friends told me, friends who had been in the UN for a while said, Kemal, don't get too excited because, you know, we've been working on Security Council reform for 30 years, so, you know, it will take some time. But anyway, it is interesting to look at, at the proposals for change of the Security Council that the Secretary General tabled, and many of you, I'm sure, are, are somewhat familiar, but let me just remind you, there were two plans, Plan A and Plan B. Plan A was to bring selected countries into the Security Council as permanent members without veto right, but still as permanent members, okay? And, uh, you know, the Secretary General didn't particularly pick on, on, on this country or that country, but the leading candidates were Japan, Germany, India, and Brazil, and then there was obvious need for an Af one or two African countries as, as specific countries joining. And then there would be uh, some other countries that would be um, non-permanent members elected. The veto remains the veto, so the, the P5 still maintain their veto, but you do have others joining in in a permanent way. So once Brazil joined, it's a permanent member. And then there was Plan B. I don't go into all the details, but Plan B had, was different because in Plan B, what you had was something a little more like the Bretton Woods system, but not no weighted voting, but constituencies, group of countries, electing representatives for very long terms two times four years. For so instead of Brazil joining, you would ha you, you, Brazil might be elected by the Latin American group and might be a member for four years or eight years, but Mexico was, or any other Latin country, Ecuador or whatever, Uruguay, was not forever excluded from the permanent status. So it was more flexible. Uh, the, the, the one which gathered a lot of steam was actually Plan A. Plan B was a little bit shelved not by the UN itself, but by the member states. There was a lot of support for, by some countries for, for example, making Japan a permanent member. But it never happened. Uh, you know, the, the whole year passed. No, no final decision was made. And I think a lot of opposition to this plan came from the fact that some countries said, look, in a sense, you're making things worse. The whole idea of having some countries as permanent members and others as not you know, introduces a fundamental inequality, and all you're doing is adding another four, five, six countries to that group forever. 
what, instead, let's, let's have it more constituency-based, but then the constituency-based plan didn't gather much steam either. So that was, that's where we are at this point. I don't know what will happen in the next year or two. I do believe some change is necessary. Um, I mean, you know, I once asked the advisor to a permanent member with a veto right, do you think that 20 years from now, your country will still be a permanent member with a veto right? And the advisor said, no. And then I said, well, what about uh, discussing, you know, some changes? He said, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we have, this, we have this funny situation that, you know, everybody kind of agrees that the present system doesn't make much sense and probably will not be around 20, 30 years from now. But when, it, when you then say, okay, well, then let's do something about it, you know, then, uh, no, we can't because it's just too ingrained. So we have, we have a very tough situation here. On the economic side, I also believe it may not be as dramatic because, you know, at the end of the day, economic crisis, even very bad economic crisis, doesn't have the same urgent, I mean, how should I put the same devastating effect as, for example, a nuclear war could have. But there are some major problems, whether it's in trade, whether it's environment, whether it's in financial systems, global stability, and, and so on. Many issues on the economic side need also a, a multilateral framework. And here, we are stuck with this situation where the IMF and the World Bank kind of do their thing. The UN system is on the other side and, and does their thing. They, they, they don't really meet very much. And there's a general feeling of... Um, the system is dominated by the rich countries. And it generates a lot of resentment on the part of the developing countries uh, and, and, and also among the emerging developing countries, both the very poor ones in Africa and elsewhere who feel powerless within that whole system, but also the, the new, the bigger guys who feel they need a place at the table now. The, the table, of course, outside that whole system where people meet and, and try to make decisions are the G8, is the G8. That's where leaders meet regularly. Um, I have to keep thinking that everything is kind of on the record, even if it's off the record. But you know, that's where somehow seven countries plus one now, plus Russia, have given themselves the right to meet and kind of decide the future of the world, okay? And, and, and um, when you think about it, China isn't there, India isn't there, Latin America isn't there. Uh, it's not, you know, it's not a framework that one can qualify as very legitimate. It may be useful to get some things going, and I, I think the G8 has made some very good decisions in the past uh, on Glen Eagles, for example, the, the, uh, the decision to really increase development aid, or at least the commitment, the promise, and other things. But when you think of the G8 as the only kind of framework for, for actually making decisions on the economic and social side worldwide, it really lacks, uh, lacks representativity and, and lacks legitimacy. So what is now being put forward increasingly by, in, in, by, in, in various ways uh, is based on two or three ba uh, principles, I would say. One is that you need a, f a, a framework, a forum, which is less than 191 countries meeting around the table, which, you know, which is too unwieldy and doesn't generate decisions. You need something where you have representatives of various regional groupings and, and some individual countries, the largest countries that come together to actually look at these global public good issues and actually make multilateralism work. The second, and I think most people kind of agree with that. The second principle, uh, I think, is that it should be, uh, you know, it should reflect the, the, the contributions, the weight, the real weight of, of countries in, in, in the international system, but should not totally exclude the smaller countries either. One proposal that the former Prime Minister of Canada, Paul Martin, had put forward was the L20. Uh, uh, of the, you, you, the G20 is the, is, is the group of large countries in the world on the finance side, and he, and, and he said, why don't we make that group evolve into a group of leaders at the Prime Minister's level? And, and, and call it the, the L20. I think the problem with taking only the large countries is that 
there are very uh, numerous small countries that absolutely have to have a place in that whole debate. You cannot exclude the, the small countries from this kind of higher level international architecture. So I think we, we need a mix. And the, the third principle I, I'd like to um, propose is that it has to be at the leader's level. I mean, that is the value, you know, for all its limitations of the G8, that people meet at heads of state or head of government level. I think the problem we have when we meet only at the sectoral level, that some of the intersectoral issues and priorities don't get even discussed or let alone solved. So we have to have some forum, some mechanism, where we don't have just the finance ministers meeting, finance ministers and central bank governors, as we do for the World Bank IMF meetings. We, we, or, or the labor ministers meet at the ILO meeting. I mean, these meetings will go on, but I do believe that we, we do need an, an, a kind of overarching framework which pulls it all together, doesn't deal with all the details, but gives some basic direction to the international system and to multilateralism. Two, there are two actual proposals out now. One is, came out uh, about a month ago by the uh, task, Global Task Force for Public Good, uh, Global Public Goods, presided by the former president of Mexico, Ernesto Zedillo, which proposes what, what, what is called the G25, which is the G20. And for those of you who don't remember, the G20 is the G7 augmented with the major emerging market countries, such as uh, India, Brazil, uh, uh, Mexico, and so on. Turkey is also uh, a member. But augment that G20 with five regional representatives from a group of smaller countries and formally you know call this the g uh, instead of the g8 the g25 and give it certain powers certain attributes to try to give impulses to the international system of course nobody is 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 saying that this this group becomes a pure decision maker they couldn't but do what the g8 does but in a much more inclusive and, and global way the other proposal is going to come out in a few days and therefore i mean i don't you know, uh, it's no longer a secret. The Secretary General did uh, create a second panel to deal more with the economic and social side, panel on coherence in development, environment, and humanitarian affairs. And that group of people, which included three prime ministers, Gordon Brown from the UK and others, comes up with a proposal for an L27, very similar to, the, to Ernesto Zedillo's and his group's uh, G25 but um, where it doesn't start from the G20, but actually starts from ECOSOC, ECOSOC being the 54 members of the General Assembly or of the UN family elected by the General Assembly uh, to deal with economic and social matters. But these are 54 countries coming you know, by, by regional groupings from all over the world. And the L27 proposal would be to ask the, 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 uh, this ECOSOC group to come together once a year at leaders' level, but half of them only, 27. And they would rotate. Maybe 20, two years would be one group, and then two, two other years would be another group of 27, which reflects, I think, the reasonable uh, concern that once you get a group like that that's too large, you, you know, you, in terms of decision-making, even having a good discussion, it becomes very difficult. 25, 20, 20, you know, at most 30 is, is what you can deal with in a, in a decision, in a, in a forum like that, where you, if you want to have real decision-making, or at least, at least real proposals for decision-making. So a lot of, a lot of that is, is, is floating around. These proposals are being made. Now, I think the reaction, you know, can be, there probably is going to be a range of reaction, but you know, to take extremes, some people will say, oh, this is irrelevant. You know, these are people making gymnastics of ideas in the international community, in the UN and elsewhere. But the fact of the matter is nation states is what counts. Power politics, real politics is, is what counts. You can create whatever group you like, but at the end of the day, it, it won't really matter. And, you know, it's the, the old game of nation states that, that continues and, and all this is not really very relevant, okay? The other extreme, of course, is to be very optimistic and say that in the face of these huge challenges, we can actually create an international decision-making architecture that, uh, that can deal with the global public bads and, and goods in a much more force, forceful way than in the past. Uh, nobody is talking of 
going above the nation state, mind you, here. It's, it's not like in the European Constitution or in, in Europe where some European federalists really viewed, you know, really going completely beyond the nation state. All these proposals are still taking the nation state as the fundamental element of the international system, but trying to create a, a, you know, a, a structure and an architecture of cooperation that will allow nation states to share some sovereignty to solve uh, particular problems. Now, I think we, we really need to think very hard about these things. I really do believe that the threats that are facing us are so big, so huge, that just business as usual you know, is, is, not, is, is just not acceptable. And in that sense, I do want to share this conviction with you today. It reminds me a little bit of Paul Krugman's book. Um, I think it was The, the Rise of... Um, I forgot the name, the, the, the Age of Diminishing Expectations. And in, in that book, he, in, in one chapter, he, he says the following about human nature. He says, look, all of us, I mean, the big problems in our life, you know, are our health, our uh, marriage, love, love life, if you like, and, and our job, our career, you know. And once in a while, we, we think about these things. But in many of my friends, he says, decide that these are two big issues to, to, to deal with. You know, my health, I mean, you know, I can't change my habits dramatically and my genes and all that, so, uh, you know, I, I may have to change my lifestyle dramatically, but, but I really can't. My health is, is more or less set in, in, in the way it is. In terms of career, you know, long ago we studied something, we, we set ourselves on a, on a certain path. Maybe it was a mistake, maybe it wasn't the right thing, maybe we would love to be a, you know, a doctor rather than a, an architect or whatever, but you know, it's just we can't now all of a sudden go back to school and learn a new trade, and we can't, we can't shift that around. You know? And love, well, love is a complicated topic, but uh, many of my friends are in, you know, in st some of them, let's say, are in relationships which maybe don't have enough passion, but you know, there's habit, there's you know, changing everything now is just too, too complicated, too nerve wracking. So they say, okay, this Sunday I'm gonna go and fix my basement. <laughs> and <laughs> and it, you know, I mean, I, 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 I think he, he, the message is, it is true that in life, you know, when you, some of the really big questions are very difficult to face. And then you, you know, it's very natural human reaction that you then you, you look for something that you can actually deal with and you try to deal with it, and it's very, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, and indeed we should do that, and that's often the way you make progress. But I do believe that given the, the threats we face now, you know, given the fact that we're so interdependent, and yet we live with a nation-state machinery, you know, that reflects the world of 50 or maybe 150 years ago, I think really carefully thinking through on how we're going to manage the global system, whether it's the ecosystem, the ecology, whether it's human security, terrorism, nuclear threats, disease, you know, these things really need global approaches and management, not to supplant the local. In many ways, the local has to do, deal with many, many things, but we need that global level. And if we don't make a real effort to, to get there, we will face in increasing problems. Networks, civil society, private sector, you know, NGOs can, can contribute a lot to that but they can't really solve the big problem. You still need state machinery and public policy to deal with the really big problems. The Middle East you know, disaster situation is not gonna so be solved by NGOs. I mean, for, you know, it, 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 NGOs can do a lot of good there, but somehow you need statecraft and you need the international community to, to see the extent of the mess and to try to do something about it. And, and I think the same goes through for environmental issues and, and so on. So we need the political, the public policy side of dimension to complete the very positive actions I think that civil society can do. And indeed, civil society can push for these decisions. Without civil society pushing for them, I, I don't think much, much will happen. So let me end then this, this plea or this, you know, this presentation on the role of the US in all that. Because I think when we look at the world, you know, half the world's armament budget is U.S. One trillion is spent on armaments, half of it is U.S. The U.S. is tremendously powerful economically and certainly in terms of defense, in terms of ideas, in terms of science, in terms of univers wonderful universities like this one. It, it's, a, it's a huge 
huge power in the world and of, of a kind perhaps that didn't exist for a very long time, maybe since the Roman, Roman times and so on. At the same time, I would, I would submit that you know, the last few years, if anything, have shown that there are tremendous limits to, to what a country like the US can achieve on, it, on its own. And, and it's becoming increasingly clear. So, I, I, you know, in, in a way, um, it's, it's, a, it, it's a huge challenge now because we, we are, in, for the US, because we, we are in a, in a multilateral system or an international architecture where certainly it's not possible to advance without the US. Okay, it's too big, too large, too powerful, too influential, too rich. The international community will not get organized without positive U.S. contribution, U.S. support. The U.S. can certainly change, uh, uh, stop any, any, any possible change in, in any direction, okay? It's powerful enough and, and large enough uh, to play that role. On the other hand, the, the U.S. Is, is, is also feeling that, you know, many initiatives are running into dead alleys, many, many things are blocked, many things are not moving ahead, and, and, there, and there are clear limits. So I do believe we now, in the next years, or maybe five years, decade or so, we, we face this, this situation where either in the US there's going to be a change and, and there will be a much more active support for multilateralism and, in, and international policy solutions to global problems, or we will face huge, huge international problems. And I'm optimistic, actually, because when you look at the history of the United States. I mean, when you look at the US, and I'm Turkish, so I'm not you know, an American citizen. So I, I say it as, a, as a, somebody who, who, who has lived in the US, who likes the US, who's been, you know, who, who is very fond of, 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 of America. But I think when you, when you look at it, actually it has, I mean, there are three, three interesting things. One, it's very global. It's a society where, you know, Jan, you're from the Czech Republic, and there are you know, compatriots from Turkey teaching. It, it's one of the most global societies. So in, in a sense, for the US to kind of relate to the global world and, and, and in a sense take a leadership in a governance system that would be appropriate to a global world, I think from a cultural psychological perspective, shouldn't be that difficult. It, it's more difficult in societies that are much more homogenous, that are, you know, which, which, which are which are less open in, 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 or it's not open to the world in the sense perhaps of travel as much as maybe a Czech citizen does, but in terms of the basic relationships, whether it's to East Asia, whether it's to, you know, African, Africa as African Americans, whether it's to the Middle East, whether it's through the connection with the Jewish community in Israel or to the connection to the Arab community, it's all there in, in the US. So in a sense, all the ingredients are there for the US to, to actually become very committed to a global solution or, or global approach to, 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 uh, to the world's key challenges. The second thing is when one looks back at, at history, of course, as I said early on during the presentation, I mean, it was actually the US leadership that led to the United Nations in the first place. I mean, the San Francisco Declaration, the, you know, the, the, all, all, this, all the very strong commitment of the US to multi, multilateralism and multilateral institutions. Uh, a beautiful speech is President Kennedy's uh, uh, address uh, at the uh, commencement of American University, I think in 1962 uh, or something like that, where you have a beautiful uh, statement about multilateralism, the rule of law in the world, the need for nation state to submit to the rule of law internationally, President Kennedy, uh, you know, a US president, uh, and, and the need for, to organize this world in, in a multilateral way. And I can, you know, I mean, whether you go back to Jefferson or even President Reagan, you know, coming from a different side of the political spectrum, a lot of multilateralism and commitment to the world actually in, in, US, in, in US leadership in the past. And finally, third point, the resource side. I mean, this is a whole different topic, much more uh, technical, economic, the, the, the twin deficits and global imbalances and, you know, the $700 billion deficit and, uh, tr uh, you know, uh, current account deficit in the US. But I, I think if you look at it from a resource point of view, it would seem quite clear that the US, you know, even though it has this huge GDP and, and, and wealth and all that, doesn't have the, the financial means to deal alone with many of these problems. It has to share 
It has to share the costs of human security, of environmental management, and, and of other issues. So um, there is also a strong economic pressure, I think, that will militate in, in, in the direction of, of a more multilateral approach in US policy. And I think when that happens, you know, it will, many things which seem impossible now will all of a sudden move ahead much more quickly. So that's why I do believe that, that it is important and that I, I, I am fairly optimistic because I think the dynamics within the U US society actually exist. Of course, others have to cooperate too. Europe and every country has to, has to move in that direction. But I think the role of the US is, is critical. And one comparison I sometimes make, I don't know how justified it is, but you know, it struck me the other day thinking about it. Because when I first came to the US, when student at Princeton, it was in 1970 at the end of the 1960s. And I think in the 1960s, you know, American society did something very, very important in terms of race relations and race integration. I think it really faced the issue in the 60s and did a lot of things. And of course, there are huge problems that remain. And, you know, uh, some uh, uh, African-American communities remain disadvantaged economically and, and income-wise and so on. But I think when you compare the US today to you know, the 50s, early 60s, there was a very, very kind of uh, deep shift in what kind of society uh, uh, you know, the US was going to be and a deep commitment by, by leaders to integration. And now you, you have a, a country where you know, uh, the Secretary of State is an African American. The Chief of Staff was an Af was a, also an African uh, origin American, and you now you know, the latest to throw in their hat into the ring, you know, Barack Obama, you know, is talking about becoming president. So I think, in in my, in my view, I'm not saying it, it's just a, I don't think it would have been feasible in the 60s at all. So there there has been a deep transformation in the psychology. I think very positive, extremely positive, of course, to a multi ethnic multiracial society in a real sense where anybody from any ethnicity, from any minority can, can go to the very top. I compare, and that, that needed a deep transformation of people's attitudes, of people's way of thinking, and so on. I compare this challenge of the, that exists in the 60s a little bit to the challenge of multilateralism now in the US. I think what, what's needed is a, a kind of realization that multilateralism is absolutely necessary for, for human security and that the US has to lead the process, has to look at it very positively, not as something to be afraid of and something that somehow will make things more difficult. On the contrary, as one of the only ways that we can manage the challenges of the, of the coming century in, in a decent way. And, and I think once that conversion happens, you know, which I think it will happen actually, then, uh, then we will have, uh, you know, we will have the, the, the strongest nation in the world playing this leadership role which we so much need. I don't think it's the only solution that, you know, again, there are many other things that are necessary for it to happen. But I do believe that, that there is this co psychological conversion that's needed. And I do feel a deep resistance to it, of course, also, you know. But I think it's a resistance that in, in the end is superficial. And that if there is some leadership in actually arguing for it without being afraid that it's a bad word, you know, then I think all of a sudden the progress may, may be much, much faster than, than we think. So this is something I, I want to share with you. It's, it is linked to the role of the United Nations because we need that support and effective United Nations cannot be there unless the major countries in the world are supportive. We cannot deal with the huge, uh, developmental issues and human security issues without that support. So, so that step that needs to be taken, where the United Nations you know, meets its, its largest member, so to speak, in a positive way and wants to move forward, I think is one of the big, big challenges uh, uh, ahead of us. Again, we need others, we need, uh, we need support from everywhere, of course, but this particular support, given that I'm talking at an American university, I think is particularly important. Many thanks.
Yeah, I think we, we do have some, some time for a few questions. Why don't we start there? Well, I think it's, it's an excellent question because Europe, in a sense, you know, led the way from, nation, from the, being the origin of nation states in the good and the bad because the European nation state was able to create a much more human society, greater social welfare, more democracy and all that. It also created two world wars and terrible destruction, you know, that nation state. So the, the attempt of Europe to kind of overcome that and, and, and create a multilateral uh, not, not a kind of supranational system, I think is very, very important. Although I would, I would be a little bit careful because when I talk of multilateralism, I don't yet, I mean, maybe, you know, our grand-grandchildren will talk of the supranationality that, that Europe in, involves, you know. So uh, there are some differences. I still believe that it's way too early and would be unrealistic to define a global project a la Europe, where, we, where, where Europe kind of tends to see itself to some degree as almost one country, you know, uh, with that flag, the flag, the blue flag. And the blue flag is very interesting. I mean, you go to all kinds of places which are no, nowhere near Europe yet, you know, like Georgia or whatever, you have the blue flag there. So there are lots of people. Um, but nonetheless, there are many elements that are very, very similar. For example, how to balance still the state versus the federal level. I mean, of course, the U.S. has, has that too. It's a federal country. Uh, how to use population weights in the voting system versus, uh, you know, having one country, one vote type of, type of system. So many, many things that the, the Europeans are exploring, I think, are very relevant to, to the global experience. I think Europe, of course, is now suffering a major setback. And in, in, in a sense, you know, uh, it's true the Constitution was rejected. I, I remain fairly optimistic. I think it, 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 you know, these things don't work linearly. Europe does have to absorb the new entrants, does have to really work on, on, on the institutions before it can, you know, it can actually have new vigor in, in its project. And there is one sentence which I really love of, by, by um, um, Jean Monnet, one of the founders of founding fathers of Europe, you know, when they asked him to define the, it's, it's actually the last sentence of his memoirs where he says, ladies and gentlemen, don't make a mistake. Our European project is not an end in itself, but just the first step to a better organized world. So in, in a sense, you know, the founder of Europe already, it wasn't just about Europe, it was about, about the world in a sense too. So there are many, many relevant aspects, but I do believe that um, in, in a way it, it, it all feeds on, on one another. You know, when, when one side blocks, the other one becomes also uh, more, less cooperative. So th there's an interaction between what's happening in the US, what's happening in Europe, what's happening in other countries, which can either be positive or, or negative. Right now it's more in, more in the negative mood than in the, in the positive mood. And then there, you know, there's this thing about efficiency, which is another given that you asked the Europe question, which I, you know, I think is an interesting point. When you walk in the European Parliament, I don't know how many of you have walked in the European Parliament, some of you, I'm sure. You have all the interpreters, you know, all the languages. I think 23 or something now, you know, given that there are 25 members. And it costs, I mean, a significant portion of the European budget is actually spent on interpretation. So, you know, one thought I had walking around the European Parliament is kind of, what a waste of resources, all these interpreters and all that. But then immediately I stopped myself and I said, look, if that's what it takes to avoid wars between these countries, you know, to lower military budgets, to create a, a, a zone of peace, I mean, let's spend the money, there's no problem, you, you know. <laughs> so there is a little bit of a, of a trade-off, you know, between the rob between trying to be super efficient versus, you know, creating the mechanism whereby, whereby you may have to talk a lot and waste some time and pay interpreters, but, you know, it, 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 it's a little bit the same at the General Assembly in the United Nations. You come in there and 
you know, one, one reaction could be, well, let's get something done, you know. And of course, that is a correct uh, request. But on the other hand, having all these people interacting in all the languages, all the translations, nobody feeling as an outsider has tremendous benefits also. Yes? the voices of three groups of people in the world really to the table. And one is women's voices. Since the um, Beijing conference in 1995 um, and the platform for action, there's been enormous resistance to moving forward, even though countries <coughs> have made some progress. And then there are farming communities who really do not want to leave the farm and go to the city, even though agricultural policies in many places and internationally policies are forcing farm families off their farms because of the low prices uh, for commodities internationally traded and um, because of government policies, which um, see a diminution of the number of farms as a worthy goal. And then the third group are indigenous communities who live, for instance, in the Brazilian rainforest and who feel that their whole way of life is tied up with particular <coughs> sites, and particular habitats, and uh, see very little regard on the mm -hmm. international for preserving um, those habitats and letting them preserve their own communities. So I'm All right. concerned about their voices reaching uh, this international framework you're talking about. Thank you very much. Maybe we'll take one or two questions more and then I can make my last because that way. Jan, you, you had a question or a comment? Very strong, so it's able to block, but not strong enough to proceed without limits, and therefore it's in its interest to uh, uh, be multilateral. And I was going to push you a little bit so we can think in recent memory, let's say the Clinton administration was, would be regarded as being much more multilateral than the current administration. If you were to take them as the base, in which direction one, two, or three things should, should, should one push to achieve the goal of becoming more multilateral? Okay, and then if, okay, if there's anybody else, then yeah, why not we take one there? Yeah, um, you mentioned that there are some issues in, that's complex internationally that can be dealt with in a more narrow and focused um, way, like environment and the, the bilateral deal between the U.S. Uh, and Guatemala. Well, my question is, like, does this approach apply to an, another area of globalization that is international trade? We all know about the issues about the Doha Rao and, and what happened and is happening. And we see the proliferation of bilateral and regional trade agreements. So like, do you see then these bilateral agreements as stumbling blocks or are they like building blocks or bigger framework? All right. Well, I mean, we, we're kind of out of bed. I'll very telegraphically say a few words, maybe on the last one. You know, I, I think some some amount of regional cooperation is is clearly a, can be a building block, but it depends a lot what type of agreement they are. And I definitely don't think that what's called the spaghetti ball, you know, the kind of all kinds of very complicated regional agreements, can replace a good multilateral, legally binding trading system. So I'm I'm concerned about the the bilateral uh, uh, deals. And the other thing, the developing countries, of course, should always realize that when they're in bilateral negotiation with the EU or the US, you know, the power balance is totally, uh, you know, against them. Whereas in a multilateral framework, when all the developing countries participate in that framework, they can, of course, bring much more weight to the table and the deal they will reach overall will probably be more in their favor if, than if, you know, Bangladesh negotiates directly with, let's say, the European Union. So in that sense, it's to the developing country's advantage, I think, to have a multilateral framework. In terms of the voice, uh, voices of you know, many groups, I, I think the UN, they're voices, but whether these voices translate into action, which I think is, is the real uh, question, that, that's much more, much more difficult. I, I must say that um, the UN is trying a lot. And in, in, within the United Nations, you know, there, is a there was a decade for indigenous people. 
on, on, on gender issues, we, we, we really hope to, to push much harder. There will be a new organization that is now being proposed. It's UNIFEM, but UNIFEM strengthened as, as a world women's and gender organization. So, but you know, for, all, for decisions to be made on all these things, again, you need the, the political level. Advocacy is, can only take you so far. Now, Jan, on the, on the 90s versus you know, afterwards, you know, President Clinton is an advisor to the UNDP on tsunami, uh, uh, post-tsunami, and so therefore once in a while he comes, we have, we have the privilege of hosting him and he comes by and we chat and all that. And I think, I think you know, the 90s, and he, he, he very much realizes that, and he, 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 it's his view also, you know. The 90s, I mean, so much could have been done during the 90s. Because the Berlin Wall collapsed, you know, the Soviet, the Cold War ended, the uh, history ended, you know, Fukuyama. Um, and there was this tremendous opportunity, in a way, to, to build the new world, you know, with new, I mean, with new institutions overcoming the Cold War blockages. Security Council reform, all the things I mentioned. The ideal time was actually the 90s to do that. Because, in a, you know, the whole thing on, on terrorism, 9-11 hadn't happened. I mean, there was a kind of positive outlook on the world. And it wasn't taken. I mean, it was not, there was no action against it, but it wasn't considered a major priority. And, and you know, let's face it it's, it, it's always in our personal lives too. You know, if there's no major challenge ahead of you, you know, if you have a heart attack, you really start a diet. If you don't have a heart attack, you know. So I think the 90s were a little bit a, a decade where, you know, there, there wasn't that much of a challenge in a sense. So while the administration in the U.S., even the first Bush administration and then Clinton, was in, in a sense much more multilateralist and, and much more uh, inclined to, to work with in, in a multilateral framework than what, you know, than what came afterwards, is I think the challenge wasn't so immediate. And I actually, you know, President Clinton has shared with, with me once that he really felt that so much more could have been done at that time. And of course, he's doing a lot now in his more private capacity. Then came this period, you know, the, the terrible, uh, uh, you know, crime of 9-11 and, and all that, and then the reaction, coupled with this, ex well, I should go back one more step. And of course, also in the 90s, I think there was an unrealistic view of US power. Okay, I mean, it was the Soviet Union was gone, no more competition, you know, that's it. Well, I think what we're seeing now is that it, um, you know, it's not that easy. There, 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 there are lots of, it's different threats. It's not no longer like the Soviet Union, another superpower, but there are many, many socioeconomic and security threats. And I think we're now getting to the point where many are realizing that in fact, I mean, that's my thesis, that one, one should move towards that multilateralism. I don't think, I mean, I, some of the proposals, you know, like in, enlarging the Security Council, or, or creating a, a L27 and really working with it are, are practical proposals. But I think what's more important than any one particular action is really the outlook, the, the approach. You know, we have these problems, how are we gonna solve them? And, and here, it, and last point, it, it, I think it needs to be a, a combination of people who share certain goals and values. You can't always get the whole world to agree with anybody. I mean, whether it's France, the US, Turkey, the Czech Republic, and so on. So there will always be certain al alliances, certain coalitions, certain you know, like-minded, we, we, in the UN system on the economic side, we have like-minded donors, which are mostly the most generous Nordics and so on, you know, who, who have their little coalition. So that, all that's fine. But the basic approach is, you know, we have to have l an international system that works. How can we actually make it work? And how can we slowly have rules of the game where people, which people submit to, like in the WTO. WTO is actually a, a fairly good progress because, you know, WTO, everybody actually, you know, submits to arbitration there. And so, you know, enlarging that kind of approach and having, building political support for multilateralism, I think is, is the essence. Once that political support is there, once people are no longer afraid you know, in an election campaign or on TV to say, yes, I am for multilateralism, you know. Once that barrier is broken, 
then I think one can sit down and say, okay, how do we do it? You know, what's the better choice? What, what, empirically, what works better? Then there are lots of things that can be debated. But first, one has to you know, go beyond that barrier, which unfortunately still exists, that even saying that you might want to work with the United Nations, you know, is not such a great political thing these days still. And, and that has to be changed. Thanks a lot. Oh, sorry. I, I think we, I have to run. Marina. Yeah, because there's a plane. Thanks a lot. We want to very much thank you for coming and have um, framed a copy of the um, wow. the the the, the um, poster that's been out front that you all saw um, with thanks for all of your work and your contribution to economic development. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.